Hello and welcome to the last lecture in this series of lectures on chemistry in everyday life. I hope you have had a good time so far in the last three lectures. In today's lecture, we will study about food additives and in food additives, we will study specifically about artificial sweeteners. Then we will move on to uh, antioxidants and uh, the role of antioxidants. Uh, eventually, we will discuss food colorants and finally, uh, chemistry of cleansing agents. So, let us begin. Food additives. What are food additives? Any chemical or ingredients which are added to a food for several purposes and those purposes would include, uh, let us say, improving upon the taste of a food. They can also be added to preserve the flavor of a food. Then sometimes it is just to increase uh, or enhance appearance of a food, right? Uh, Let us say an ice cream on a strawberry f uh, flavor should be, you always expect it to be bright red colored like strawberry, right? Any dull colored ice cream might not give you uh, that kind of appeasement. And sometimes it could be to enrich nutritional value of a food right. So, uh, with this there are uh, various kind of food additives and this would include food colors, this would also include uh, flower improvers and also sweeteners, uh, antioxidants, preservatives, fat emulsifiers and stabilizing agents, the kind of molecules you always uh, use for uh, those ice cream preparations and all right preservatives you use while uh, you know preparing those pickles and that kind of stuff when food has to be kept for a long long time. Uh, and then certain nutritional supplements uh, such as minerals, vitamins and amino acids. So, nowadays uh, this has been a trend of having those uh, high nutritional value uh, you know those syrups or those drinks uh, which are abundantly available in market. For this particular lecture which happens to be the last lecture in this series, we will be discussing about uh, sweetness and antioxidants including food colors. So, these three types of things will uh, uh, molecules we will consider in uh, these food additives. We will begin our studies with uh, uh, food sweetness. So, sweetness can be uh, basically of two kinds. One type of sweetness are the ones which uh, are obtained from nature, right? So, something like sugar uh, and or maybe honey, when we talk of sugar refined, it is not exactly natural, it is quite refined, been processed, but let us say uh, you look at those, uh, uh, you know, such jaggery for example, that is more natural in its comparison. Then there is an entirely different class of compounds which is uh, man-made and artificial. Nevertheless, they are also very sweet and these are a class of artificial sweetness. Now, example as is being shown in uh, this slide in this picture is uh, a very famous uh, artificial sweetener called saccharin, right? Now, there is another thing. Most of these natural sweeteners are uh, generally of high nutritional value. You may not call it great, but certainly they are high nutritional value, meaning thereby they provide you enough energy, right? For example, you take some sugar and you get uh, glucose within no time, right? And on the other side, well, when we talk about artificial sweeteners, uh, generally these sweeteners are, they would have a very limited nutritional value and sometimes they would have no nutritional value, which means that for most of these molecules, uh, the body is not able to uh, process these molecules in any way which will provide energy to the system, right? So, no glucose, nothing. So, in, in order for any body, uh, any molecule to have a nutritional value, it must be able to produce those ATPs, must be able to somehow find its way into the Krebs cycle and produce energy. So, these molecules are not able to uh, work in that manner. 
as far as uh, you know their artificiality is concerned not all the molecules having sweetening properties uh, you know with no nutritional value are artificial there are some compounds like steviocytes etc they are actually found in nature and they are still they won't have any nutritional value but still they are extremely sweet compounds you have read so much about sugars so we are not going to discuss anything about natural sugars the kind of molecules which interest us are these artificially derived non nutritional sweetness okay why do we need these kind of non nutritional sweetness primarily for two or three reasons as you could also uh, probably assume first one being for patients who are suffering from diabetic right because in diabetic you really would like to control your insulin machinery and in order to control insulin machinery you don't really uh, would like to feed it with uh, ready made glucose molecules right something of the kind of sugars when we intake so then diabetic patients are generally refrained from taking sugar rich food leave alone sugars so for these molecules uh, for these patients to get a flavor of sweetness it is important that they thrive upon certain other class of compounds and these non nutritional uh, sugars non nutritional sweetness they would come handy for these uh, patients second is the you know the kind of people who want to who are suffering from obesity and they would like to reduce waste now one good way to reduce waste is you don't thrive upon uh, those sugars so again for such people in order to have that tinge of sweetness in foods they would rather like to go on non nutritional foods than to thrive upon uh, the traditional sugars right another very important thing is about the economics when you talk of most of these artificial compounds one thing is uh, invariably seen in these compounds that they are extremely potent on a sweetness to weight basis when compared to when when compared to sucrose which is your natural sugar right let me elaborate on this point in the coming slides i'll uh, you will come to know what i really mean by this so these are uh, some of the molecules we are going to study six basic class of compounds we will discuss aspartame we will discuss saccharin sucralose acesulfame cyclamate and allitame these are all uh, approved sweeteners uh, in most of the countries and as and when i'll i'll also show you in certain countries when some of these molecules or one of these molecules are not used uh, i'll show you the um, examples as and when we discuss them so the important point to mention here is how much sweet is an artificial sweetener which means how would we measure a sweetness potency of a particular molecule right for example we generally claim that aspartame is 200 times more sweeter than a simple sugar molecule which is sucrose okay so it is 200 times sweeter now the point is how do we measure it well that's very interesting you would be surprised to know there is no instrument which would measure sweetness for you instead there are a set of experts trained experts which are human beings people right they are trained expert people who would tell you a uh, relative sweetness of a particular compound relative to 5% sucrose solution or 10% sucrose solution on a on on a scale so let's see you know they are first trained hard to identify sweetness of 5% sucrose solution or 10% sucrose solution all right and then uh, the molecules which are to be evaluated for sweetness are fed to these uh, uh, to these experts for example let's say 0.025% of aspartame is equivalent in sweetness to 5% sucrose okay 5% they feel like this type of sweetness which gets by having 5% sucrose is equal to uh, aspartame which is having a consistency of 0.025% in this case potency of this aspartame is 5 upon 0.025 which turns out to be 200 
which means potency of aspartame is 200 times more than sucrose. So isn't it interesting, right? So more interesting thing is coming uh, just now. Now, very interesting thing, response versus concentration curve here or uh, you know this graph here for sweetness which means if you in keep on increasing concentration of a particular sweetness what is the response so for example if 5 percent solution will give you uh, this much sweetness okay to this point then let's say 10 percent of that solution will give you a response which should be just double right and then 20 percent should be double of 10 percent right but then that is not the way it happens. So you do not get this kind of a linear response. Instead, uh, like you see in this example, 2 percent sucrose solution would have a potency of 625 relative to aspartame, okay? which means aspartame is 625 times more sweeter in comparison to 2 percent sucrose solution. right? But when you take this measurement relative to 10 percent sucrose solution, potency decreases to just 110, right? So what you would generally note is increasing the concentration would no longer produce increasing sweetness and then a response would asymptotically approaches a maximum value. This uh, a maxima is approached in no time. That is a very commonsensical response to draw, right? Because what would happen since there are experts, there, are, there is a human intervention which is going to measure sweetness. So beyond a certain point, every sweet will be very, very sweet or extreme sweet. It will be limitation of our own uh, ability to judge. Okay? The, our receptors, our sweetness receptors, they will be completely saturated with, these, with those molecules and it will be very difficult for a person to judge uh, the relative sweetness of two molecules. Okay? Now I already mentioned about uh, the, the receptors. Right? So when we talk of mode of action of these sweetener molecules, it means the second question we are coming to is uh, how do our body perceives a molecule or some taste as sweet. That is actually a very difficult uh, business for scientists to do. Simply because you know you must understand taste cells uh, actually lies in this epithelia which epithelia is uh, actually surrounding these taste buds. right? And these epithelia, these taste active cells are very difficult to isolate. More difficult is the phenomena of actually isolating exact receptors which are, uh, you know, which are actually able to send a signal for sweetness. And in the previous lectures, I have already apprised you about the receptors and how receptors behave. So uh, the problem in hand here is that uh, to isolate receptor specific binding of those sweetener molecules from non-specific binding to other components is extremely difficult. Which means that people have gathered this opinion that these sugar molecules and other uh, you know, non-sugar sweeteners, they bind to receptors also and apart from the receptors, there are also certain non-receptor areas where these molecules can bind and elicit a sweet response. Okay? What has been known so far in this area is this. So this is a particular cell, a taste cell, okay, which is to elicit this uh, sweet response here. Basically giving you sweet responses to kind of give a signal to adjoining nerves and a signal to passing nerves will be given through opening and closing of these ion channels. Uh, in case of sugars, the ion channels in question are potassium and calcium ion channels. So closing of one ion channel and opening of another ion channel will give you enough response to the adjoining nerves which will take the signal to brain and make brain uh, feel that something sweet has been taken. Okay? Now using manipulating these ion channels can be done in two ways. A molecule can directly bind to these ion channels. 
right. Uh, in the other case, molecules can actually bind to a particular receptor and through binding of this, this receptor, a cascade of activity will uh, start to happen. And because of this activity, what happens is basically uh, certain enzymes are activated. Because of those enzyme activations, certain, second, certain secondary messengers are evolved and those secondary messengers are able to finally control this type of uh, uh, you know ion channels here and elicit a sweet response. It is broadly perceived amongst the scientific community that non-sugar sweetness or non-nutritional sweetness they generally bind to these type of receptors. Whereas sugar molecules uh, uh, those uh, sweeteners, those su sucrose, glucose, other molecules, they generally bind to these type of ion channels, okay. And this is actually one reason why uh, these non-nutritional sugar mole uh, sweet molecules are actually so sweet because a very small amount of receptor being impregnated can elicit a huge response and that we have seen during our drug design lectures, previous uh, two lectures or so, right. So with this, I will uh, now take up all those examples one by one and uh, apprise you of the merits and demerits, if any, of these non-nutritional sweet molecules. The first one in hand is aspartame. Aspartame, as you could see, is a dipeptide and it is a dipeptide of aspartic acid and phenylalanine ester. So if you note here, this part is aspartic acid, right, this part. And this part is a methyl ester of phenylalanine. I hope you are aware of these, uh, uh, aminic, uh, these amino acid residues. Now, this molecule is around 200 times more sweeter than table sugar. Hence, a very small minute amount is consumed resulting in negligible calorie contribution since it is not entirely non-nutritional. It provides 4 kilocalories per gram. The discoverer of this compound was James uh, Slater in 1965 and by 1981 FDA approved its use as a sweetener molecule. Uh, as the legend says, this scientist was actually working on anti-ulcer compounds and uh, you know just as serendipitous ways, uh, he just licked his finger and he found out extreme sweetness and that is how he zeroed on to this particular compound. This compound aspartame is used in almost all food categories but major consumption is in beverages. Now if you look at synthesis of this molecule as organic chemist I think uh, that should interest you. You have to uh, combine those two peptides, uh, those two amino acids, right. So you begin your synthesis with uh, aspartic acid here and this aspartic acid, this amino group is actually protected. Uh, we would not like to uh, give more consideration on to these protective groups here. Uh, but you know for your understanding you must uh, keep in mind that this is protected. Now you treat it with acetic anhydride and by treating with acetic hydride this will result in a formation of an uh, anhydride here. So you form an anhydride of aspartic acid. Now with this anhydride it requires just a nucleophile uh, to probably act upon any of these two carbons. So you take phenylalanine and a methyl ester of phenylalanine is reacted with this and this phenylalanine molecule will act on this carbon to give you this type of a dipeptide, a protected dipeptide and eventually this protection is finally removed using reductive conditions and one gets this aspartame molecule. Now there are couple of questions uh, and very interesting observations which I must share with you. Generally in formation of peptide bonds, it is a commonplace knowledge to activate your carboxylic group right? and that means you would have to incur an additional synthetic step. Now in this case, uh, you know the one who's, uh, who probably created its synthesis had been very meticulous using acetic anhydride here in order to just activate this compound into an anhydride. 
So there is no need of any activation uh, uh, reagent here in this particular reaction. The second thing about this is as I told you this nucleophile in amine will act on this particular carbon and the resulting molecule will be aspartate. With equal propensity this amine will also act can also react on this carbon and give you a side product which will not be aspartate right. So this is something which uh, one would need to be wary of in this particular synthetic method. So there is a uh, there is a propensity of a side product in good uh, proportions which can form out of this reaction. Another important thing once you take aspartame molecule once you take aspartame as uh, a sweetener it tends to get metabolized in the body. Now I told you that all these are non-nutritional it means they are not going to find their way in Krebs cycle in fact whenever you take any of these non-nutritional molecules body will recognize them as foreign particles and the body will like to get rid of them as soon as possible just like a drug molecule ok. So they will find the same way as a drug is eliminated from the body which means it will be uh, metabolized in liver as soon as possible. So the moment it reaches liver it will be acted upon by enzymes and it will be hydrolyzed this peptide bond will be hydrolyzed resulting in formation of both the monomers which is aspartic acid and phenylalanine. Now the problem is for people who suffer from a disease called phenylketonuria which is uh, their body's inability to process phenylalanine and then phenylalanine tends to get accumulated in the body. So for such patients uh, using aspartame as a non-nutritional sweetener is certainly not advisable right. So let us move on to the second molecule the second molecule we are going to study is saccharin. This is the most widely used non-nutritive sweetener in the world molecule is benzene isothiazole dioxide. So it is an isothiazole dioxide here. <coughs> this molecule is sparingly soluble in water hence it is used as a sodium and calcium salt. Uh, because there are metals involved here this does not provide a very sweet clean sweet taste and generally one is left with a small you know a minor feeble bitter or metallic of taste uh, after some time. Discoverer of this molecule uh, were Ramson and Falberge. They were working on making food preservatives from coal tar uh, wherein uh, one of those uh, scientists they spilled a bit of the sample on his, uh, on his hand and observed extraordinary sweetness. This molecule is 300 times more sweeter than sucrose or sugar and therefore it is more uh, sweeter than the first molecule we studied aspartame. Right. Uh, second thing is it is cheaper than sucrose on a cost per sweetness basis so that I told you uh, since you require such a small amount of a compound their cost uh, becomes even uh, smaller right uh, on a relative scale. So if you look at the synthesis of this molecule again synthesis is very simple and conform to the standards to which uh, uh, you know you people you students are exposed in your 11th and 12th. Uh, so we start with methyl anthranilate basically it is an anthranilic acid so a methyl ester of anthranilic acid is the starting compound for this reaction. Now this substrate is acted upon uh, with sodium nitride and some sulfuric acid in uh, very low temperatures. So you know which reaction is going to occur I am talking about diazotization reaction and as a result of diazotization reaction a disonium compound will form. Now this disonium compound as it is uh, such a wonderful electrophile uh, we impregnate it with you know nucleophiles in sulfur dioxide and chlorine uh, using a process called mommy process. As a result of this process uh, one gets uh, this sulfoxyl chloro uh, derivative of this anthranilic acid. Now once you obtain this compound it is treated with uh, uh, amine with ammonia and what ammonia does is it acts as uh, some sort of uh, uh, bi electrophile here. So it replaces this ester group from this carbon 
and at the same time it replaces this chloro from this sulfuryl chloride and eventually one gets uh, with the final compound saccharin. It has good chemical st stability and very low cost and therefore it is used as I told in the previous uh, slide also it is the most widely used uh, sweetener. It is used in toothpaste, it is used in mouthwashes, it is used in pharmaceuticals, in foods and beverages in all plethora of uh, activities. Okay. Uh, there are certain safety concerns with saccharin though uh, since um, this is this has been there had been certain reports of it is being associated with bladder cancer uh, although it is not been really confirmed and this part is still debated. Uh, but uh, you know so there is there is some small caveat uh, with which one should actually take these kind of molecules. With this I come to the next molecule in line which is uh, acesulfame K and K denotes potassium here uh, since it is a salt of potassium. It is a member of dihydrooxathazinone dioxide so again you have this sulfur dioxide moiety here and it is uh, uh, an oxathazone. So, you have this oxathazone here. This is a very highly stable crystalline sweetener. It is stable to hydrolysis even in highly acidic uh, beverages. It has extreme water solubilities. It was discovered by Kloss and Jensen in 1970. Now, if you look at the uh, its sweet index, its sweetening index, you find that this compound is 200 times more sweeter than sugar. Uh, so, and the other important point about this is it is perceived quickly without any unpleasant delay as we saw with the previous compound we studied, saccharin, right. Now, again if you look at the metabolites, Again this is a foreign particle so body would like to get rid of this molecule. Uh, the advantage is if you look at the metabolite uh, once it is acted upon hydrolytic, uh, hydrolytically uh, one gets this ring opened up into an, a bond cleavage occurring at this sulfur oxygen bond. Uh, one gets this kind of uh, uh, acetoacetamide sulfonic acid and this compound is a physiologically benign substance it has not shown any toxicities. Hence this compound you can consider as a safe compound uh, to intake uh, as a replacement of sugar molecules. So as far as synthesis of this compound acesulfame K is concerned you start with uh, an isocyanate. Isocyanates are these molecules with this functionalities. C uh, carbon joined with an oxygen and joined with nitrogen through double bonds. So this makes this carbon uh, extremely electrophilic. Okay. So, what we do is it is treated with acetone and with acetone it is uh, uh, with this carbon, uh, this carbon acts as a nucleophile here acts on this carbon and eventually gets to this particular compound which is uh, halosulfonyl acetoacetamide. Now, if you treat this again with a base, what base is going to do is abstract a proton from this position, this methyl position and eventually convert this structure into an enolate, right. So, you would have a double bond here and OH and you would have a double bond here and CH2. So, with this enolate there is a possibility of attack, nucleophilic attack from this carbon as well as from this oxygen to this sulfur since uh, one would like to get rid this compound would like to get rid of this uh, chlorine here right. It is a uh, intramolecular cyclization reaction. What eventually happens is it is an oxygen which uh, reacts and basically you can ascribe this reaction to uh, hard hard interactions you have oxygen as an uh, hard anion here and you have sulfur as an uh, hard uh, you know electrophile. So, if you look at applications of this, uh, it is a non-caloric sweetener, it is excreted completely and rapidly in urine, it is used in low calorie and calorie reduced beverages. Generally it is blended with other sweeteners and uh, generally those synergistic effects of sweeteners are they give more a better quality for these artificial sweeteners. Next molecule in line is cyclamate. Cyclamate is a salt of cyclamic acid 
and cyclamic acid is this compound, this sulfonic acid here. So, a sodium salt of this sulfonic acid uh, would be considered sodium cyclamate. If this is calcium salt, then it is called calcium cyclamate. So, generally people who are on low sodium diet, they are uh, given this calcium salt and uh, otherwise sodium salt is uh, the one which is prevailed more. Discoverer of this compound was uh, Mikhail Sweda, Michael Sweda, I am sorry, in 1937. If you look at the relative sweetener index, you find this compound as 30 times more sweet in comparison to sucrose. There is again some bitter off taste, but it has good sweetness uh, synergy with saccharin and it is stable over wide range of pH and temperatures. Synthesis of this is quite straightforward. You start from this cyclohexylamine and sulfonation of the cyclohexylamine under basic conditions will provide you with this uh, sulfonic uh, derivative, sulfonyl derivative of this uh, hexylamine, which is nothing but cyclamate. Uh, likewise, if in order to uh, metabolize this compound within the body, it will again get converted into cyclohexylamine, but the problem is this cyclohexylamine has been found to uh, bring chromosomal damage in animals and tumors in rats. So, it is not approved for sale uh, uh, by FDA and it is also not used in uh, Indian markets just for the same reason. So, it is considered a carcinogenic compound. Another compound is sucralose which is just a trichloro derivative sucrose molecule. So, you note a chlorine here, another chlorine here and you have another chlorine here. Uh, right now it is approved in Canada, Australia and recently it has been approved in US also for uh, sweetener use. So, there were these scientists uh, Tete and Lyle, they found that substitution of uh, hydroxyl group of sucrose by halogens, it, it was found to increase sweetness potency dramatically. So, what they did was they converted this sucrose into trichloro derivative uh, which is sucralose uh, and it has a pleasant sweet taste, uh, it is stable over wide range. Uh, however, as you would also note that this colorization and there would be some amount of HCl liberation, hydrochloric acid liberation uh, with this molecule at high temperatures. Hence, one should be careful uh, of using this compound also. I am not going into uh, the synthesis of this molecule now, uh, simply because it involves a lot of protection and deprotection steps which I do not consider uh, in purview of uh, this, this course. So, this brings me to another dipeptide which is uh, alitame and if you note here, it also contains aspartic acid and alanine and with this there is another component which is tetramethylthiatane. Okay? This compound is extremely sweet, so it is 2000 times sweeter than alitame. Uh, it is much more stable also than aspartame. Uh, again, I am not going into nitty gritties of synthesis of this molecule as well since it's all, it also involves uh, a multi step uh, process uh, which I feel is should not be in the purview of this discussion. So, broadly what we look into is uh, whenever you look into a molecule as an artificial sweetener, there are certain properties, it should be cost effective, it should have improved properties, improved in terms of less toxicity, no side effects and easy metabolism and then it should be, it should also have a viable process for commercial production as we saw in case of aspartame, saccharines, they are very easy processes or cyclamic, uh, cyclamates and all. So, easy reactions, easy synthesis, cost effective methods and better properties uh, are the ones uh, which people look for and this is still a burgeoning area. Many people are continuously uh, working on this area to find out new molecules with better properties as uh, sweetness. Okay? So, with this I will take uh, uh, this journey forward to next kind of compounds which are antioxidants and basically uh, uh, you know you must understand why one would require uh, antioxidants because uh, you know in our body uh, during normal respiration process, during normal digestive processes, whenever we take some food, there is always generation of certain free radicals. 
okay even with simple oxygen which we take for breathing uh, gets converted into a kind of um, oxygen free radical which converts into peroxy free radical and that free radical peroxy free radical can actually go on and form uh, hydrogen peroxide in the body so these are called reactive oxygen species which keep on getting formed as uh, you know as a side product you can say of metabolic processes taking place in the body now the problem is that even if they are side processes they are extremely hazardous okay and they are ex hazardous to an extent that these peroxides tend to react on and tend to act upon cellular membranes they act on lipids present on cellular membranes they act on nucleic acids in dna's they act on uh, let's say uh, you know other protein structures uh, which could be part of very important enzymes in the body so gradually slowly and steadily they tend to kill these structures okay tend to distort these structures and with distorting of these important biomolecules longevity of a human being uh, tends to decrease so then that's why we say a person having a uh, lot of free radicals probably uh, will have a lot of disastrous or negative processes going inside so now there comes this class of antioxidants molecules which are there to scavenge these free radicals formed within the body right so antioxidants they act as scavengers and they scavenge peroxy and oxy free radicals formed during auto oxidation radical chains so i told you there are these auto oxidation processes continuously taking place within the body even as you breathe so what basically happens when these peroxy radicals for example they tend to generate uh, reactive uh, free radicals from biomolecules uh, you know any of them could be represented as this r free radical so these uh, free radicals then tend to engage in chain propagation steps meaning thereby they will constantly react with oxygens produce these peroxy radicals and these peroxy radicals will again generate this r here this r free radical forming this peroxy acid in process right now what would an antioxidant do then antioxidants have this inherent ability to uh, kind of generate free radicals which are able to stop these chain propagations as and when these happen so mostly these uh, antioxidant molecules they contain certain groups generally phenolic groups which play a major role in stabilizing uh, these type of uh, peroxy these type of free radical compounds so they stop this chain propagation from occurring forward and that's how they stop this uh, oxidative uh, processes occurring in the body called oxidative stress within the body okay we'll discuss only one representative compound and this compound is vitamin e which is more specifically called tocopherol it is found in plants and animals and it's a necessary complement uh, necessary complement of antioxidants uh, right there are other uh, vitamins also like ascorbic acid vitamin c is also a fantastic antioxidant molecule uh, we will only consider this vitamin e uh generally uh, lipids uh, on the surface of cereal food are easily oxidized and emit unpleasant odors you might have seen that uh, and heard about a process called rancidity so when you leave a fatty acid when you leave an oil for a long time in oxidation under oxidative atmosphere in air you would see that after some time it will start to give you a very foul smell and that smell is uh, uh, you know that process is called rancidity that smell comes out of those peroxy acids which are formed so in order to preserve those oils generally vitamin e is added uh, or sprayed onto these molecules so what vitamin e in fact does i told you this process of generation of these peroxy uh, radicals right so you look at this molecule now this is a molecule of tocopherol and because of this uh, oxygen here it tends to get oxidized through a single electron transfer reaction forms a free radical here and in the process of forming a free radical it actually is able to provide another uh, electron to this peroxy radical and stop this propagation uh, process right here and in turn it itself gets stabilized into uh, formation of this kind of dimeric species or sometimes some molecules can also engage in formation of quinones 
Okay, so in that case, they are able to release two electrons, one electron at a time, right? And all those quinones or these kind of dimeric species are very stable compounds. So they do not go uh, any further oxidative processes, right? And that's how they put a full stop to an oxidative process occurring within the body. Coming to the next class of studies is food colorants. Again, in this case, uh, food colorants could be natural pigments, they could be added colorants. I will keep my discussion to uh, natural pigments, wherein I will discuss about carotenoids, which are responsible for colors in various vegetable products and in animal products like fruits, eggs, dairy products and cereals. Uh, if you look at the structure of these carotenes, you would note that these are highly conjugated structures. Right? Look at the double bonds in conjugation. There are so many double bonds in conjugation. It has a logic. A molecule having extended double bond, conjugated double bonds tend to be a colored compound simply because what would a compound need to be colored? Right? If you understand this, you, you know, a compound in order to behave as a colored compound should be able to absorb photoelectric uh, uh, radiation, so those photoradiations, those photons, right. Now with extended conjugation, uh, difference between the filled orbitals uh, of these molecules and unfilled orbitals, uh, the difference starts to become lesser and lesser. And there is a point that it becomes so less that a small, uh, you know, frequency, a small energy photon uh, coming from uh, photoradiation is enough to make that electron jump from an unfilled orbital to a filled orbital. It means it has started to absorb radiations and through absorption it will give you a certain color. So that is the reason why you need extended conjugation in molecules in order for them to behave as colored. Another class of compounds is anthocyanins which are again if you look at there is an extended conjugation in the molecules and polyhydroxy uh, functionalities and uh, this provide you all those bright colors seen in berries uh, in different uh, other uh, uh, you know fruits. Uh, one interesting thing about them is generally if you have more hydroxy compounds the color shifts from red to blue. Okay? Uh, at the same time, if uh, you have more of uh, uh, methyl substituted by methoxy, again the color changes from blue to red. So you look at these examples here, pelerogonadine, cyanidine, delphinidine and you see in strawberry you have pelerogonadine and cyanidine. So the color is red, in case of delphinidine, cyanidine in black currants, the color is more, on, uh, more in this blue hinge. Okay? This brings me to the last topic of today's lecture and that is about cleansing agents. Uh, cleansing agents is, you all know water is a fantastic cleansing agent, right? Since you do not need anything to clean your hands other than water. Uh, but sometimes water is not good enough, so you need uh, to wash your hands with soaps and detergents which are all uh, class of synthetic cleansing agents then. Uh, why water is not good? Because uh, there are dust particles which water itself is not really able to take out and oily particles, greasy particles which uh, water alone is not able to uh, take out from, uh, from the skin or from clothes and hence one needs soaps and detergents. So what are these soaps? Uh, these soaps are basically sodium or potassium salts of long fatty acids. You know about fatty acids, right? So a sodium salt or potassium salt of a fatty acid will uh, be uh, you know generally uh, will be a soap, a soap of different kinds. So for example, in example here, this is a soap of stearic acid, this is a soap of palmitic acid. If you know how these fatty acids are produced in plants, you would understand that they are always produced as triglycerides which are called fats. So a fat is a triglyceride molecule of a representative fatty acid. So if you react this fat with a strong base like sodium hydroxide and heat it, you would find that hydrolytic action of base will take place. And this hydrolytic action of removing this ester from this glycerol molecule is called saponification. So as an act of saponification, one gets a soap molecule and glycerol. Glycerol can be retrieved back and that is how one gets soap. There are various kinds of soap. 
transparent soaps, medicated soaps, laundry soaps, uh, scoring soaps, shaving soaps, etc. depending upon uh, the kind of uh, the use for which they are made and that is done by using uh, certain other additives like adding perfumes to soap, adding certain medicinal compounds to soap, so on and so forth. What is the phenomena of a soap taking dust away? Look at this surface. This is a surface of a cloth for example, right? This surface contains a lot of grease, okay? Let us say these oily particles are on the surface of a cloth. Now, uh, when you add water, uh, when you add soap to it, soap has a fat loving tail and a water loving head. So, once in water, it arranges in this type of uh, globular or round structures in which the core is surrounded by these fat loving tails whereas the surface is surrounded by uh, these polar chains. So, within this core they actually engulf uh, you know this uh, fat particle or this oil or this grease and basically this grease is separated into emulsions and hence now when you wash it uh, vigorously with water water is able to carry out these emulsions, take away these emulsions, leaving this surface of the cloth clean for you. Problem and limitation with soap is, if you treat it with the hard water, a water which contains calcium, water which contains magnesium or iron, uh, they tend to get, uh, they tend to form salts of magnesium, calcium or iron and all these salts they form insoluble, insoluble uh, precipitates and these insoluble precipitates uh, then make render activity of soap ineffective. In order to address this one actually resort to detergents, detergents which are, uh, which have stronger cleaning action than soap, which works better in soft and hard water both. So, if you look at their composition, detergents composition, you generally see they are anionic, they can be cationic or they can be non-ionic. So, as the name suggests, uh, we will consider first anionic detergents, which means that uh, this time the long chain has to be uh, anionic. So, one way to get to this anionic chain is sulfonation of a long fatty acids. Now, in this case, fatty acid is first reduced to an alcohol. For example, uh, in this case you have lauric, uh, lauryl alcohol uh, and this lauryl alcohol is sulfonated using concentrated sulfuric acid which gives lauryl hydrogen sulfate and then this sulfate is uh, hydrogen sulfate is just reacted with a base. So, in order to get a requisite counter ion. So, in this case this whole uh, fatty acid uh, chain is cationic, anionic with a counter ion which is cationic and this is a class of anionic detergent. Sometimes you really need not natural fatty acid, use those natural fatty acids. So, in this case one can start with dodecyl benzene, again the same way this is being sulfonated at one end of this benzene and eventually a counter ion is generated using treatment with sodium hydroxide and one gets sodium dodecyl benzene sulfonate. Again that is an example of anionic detergents. So, look at the properties of and uses of these anionic detergents. First of all they are cheap to manufacture as we just saw what you need is just convert them uh, if you are talking about a natural uh, you know fatty acids just reduce it to an alcohol and that alcohol can actually be sulfonated and that sulfonated can provide you an anionic detergent. Uh, so, they are cheap to manufacture. Uh, second petroleum industry provide uh, you know a lot of raw materials for this as we saw in the previous examples. They are very efficient in cleansing action and they are generally commonly used in household works. Okay. So, the same thing about cationic detergents, in this case the long chain has to be cationic now and a counter ion should be anionic. So, uh, one easy way to get a cationic long chain is to use quaternary ammonium salts. So, one takes quaternary ammonium salt here of cetyl trimethyl uh, uh, compound. So, you have this long chain and a terminal quaternary nitrogen bearing a positive charge and uh, the salt of it is with a halogen, a bromine here will give you a cationic detergent. 
Now, in comparison to anionic detergents, cationic detergents have poor detergency. They are used for germicides or fabric softeners and specialist emulsifiers. Now, important point to note is they are generally expensive uh, in comparison to uh, other anionic and non-ionic detergents and they are very uh, less used. They have limited applications as you can also see. Now, as far as non-ionic detergents are concerned, now in this case you do not need ions and the you know an easy way to go around it would be just to take a fatty acid or an acid and react it with an alcohol. This time this alcohol should be different from uh, glycerol as nature does. So, one gets an ester of this compound. In this particular example, we have taken steric acid. It is reacted with polyethylene glycol and one gets a compound which is this, uh, uh, you know, this ester here which is non-ionic detergent. Okay. Uh, as far as properties and uses of non-ionic detergents is concerned, they have enormous properties. They, uh, you know, enormously they are used. Uh, they are the biggest group of detergents. Uh, for example, in liquid dishwashing detergents, uh, they are generally used uh, and other applications also. Now, one important point I told you about uh, detergents is that they can be used with both uh, hard water and the normal water. So, what happens when they are treated with hard water containing salts of magnesium and calcium? So, in this case, I am taking an example of an ionic uh, detergent and this anionic detergent upon reaction with hard water using these uh, having these salts of magnesium will form a magnesium salt of this sulfonate. But unlike magnesium salt in case of soaps, magnesium salt of those fatty acids which I told you were uh, not soluble in water. In this case, these magnesium salts of sulfonate, since sulfonate is very polar. So, this salt is going to remain soluble in water and therefore, it does not interfere in its cleaning properties uh, uh, you know, uh, of, of the detergent and that is a big advantage with detergents. But again, uh, with every good thing, it comes with certain caveats. So, when you talk of detergents, there are also certain disadvantages and, in, and an important disadvantage is uh, they are being non-biodegradable and they are being harmful to skin also to an extent. Uh, you know, uh, more than that, they tend to produce stable and harmful foams in water uh, which creates soil pollution, which creates danger to aquatic life, which also uh, does uh, water pollution at large. So, one must also look into alternatives into other compounds in future. This is also a science which needs to be uh, you know taken more seriously and other compounds need to come with detergent actions which should have uh, you know which should be easily metabolizable, which should be biodegradable and should be easy on mother nature. Okay? So, with this our topic is coming to an end uh, before uh, I finally close down. Uh, let me summarize what we did for this particular lecture. We started with food additives and in food additives, we specifically targeted sweetness, uh, antioxidants and food colors. In sweetness, I spoke about all the prevalent molecules, uh, uh, you know, present in the market as artificial sweetness, their, uh, you know, their limitations, their uses and their usefulness. In antioxidants, we limited our discussion to molecules from nature. Okay, which can which impart colors to foods and other uh, other things. Uh, then uh, finally, we move to cleansing agents. In cleansing agents, we discussed soaps and detergents, advantages of detergents, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis soaps, and also their limitations and their uh, impact on environment. This lecture was uh, prepared using these uh, references shown on the screen, and students are encouraged to uh, go to these references in order to further read uh, and inquire about this topic. With this, I thank you all for your patient hearing and uh, this was the fourth lecture and last lecture in this series. So, I hope uh, you must have drawn some very important points from all these four lectures. Thank you very much for staying with me.